All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Abajoy Burnett. I am the moderator for this very special podcast series called A Journey for Women of Color under Johns Hopkins Medicine, A Woman's Journey podcast, Insights That Matter. Now, as a news reporter, I am so aware of the importance of having vital information that is accurate, especially when it comes to our health. And so that's why I'm so excited today to be able to talk about this subject. This week's podcast is focused on sickle cell anemia. And this is something that so many people have heard about. You probably know people in your family who have experienced this disease, who are living with this disease, but you don't know all of the details. So my guest today is hematologist, Dr. Robert Brodsky. Dr. Brodsky serves as a professor of medicine and director of the division of hematology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. His area of clinical expertise is classical hematology and haplo identical bone marrow transplant for sickle cell disease and aplastic anemia. So Dr. Brodsky, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm so excited to dig in deep into this topic of conversation with you. So let's go through the stats first. I know doctors are steeped in the details and the figures. So according to the National Institute of Health's National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, sickle cell disease affects approximately 100,000 Americans. Many of them are African-American and more than 20 million people worldwide. So Dr. Brodsky, what exactly is sickle cell anemia? Sickle cell anemia is a genetic disease, meaning you're born with it. It's a mutation in one of the genes that controls hemoglobin. Hemoglobin carries oxygen in the red cell. And when you carry two copies of that mutation from your parents, the red blood cells sickle, and that's where it gets its name. And you can imagine going through very small blood vessels. These cells don't have the ability to get through the small spaces as well as a normal red blood cell, and they can get stuck. And it causes what we call a vaso-occlusive crisis, meaning it blocks the blood vessel. And when you're blocking small blood vessels, you're preventing oxygen delivery from getting to the tissues and it can cause a lot of pain and organ damage. Is that why it's so painful? Is it because of the lack of oxygen flow? Yes, that's part of the reason it is so painful. Many of these pain crises occur in areas where there's low oxygen tension. The pain can be just incredibly intense from small what we call infarcts or blockages of blood vessels. I wonder if the prevalence rate of 100,000 Americans, is that still an accurate figure? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's a little north of that. And actually, the Centers for Disease Control is doing a surveillance program of states. And there's, I think, about 10 or 11 states now that are involved in this to try and get those numbers. It's very important, especially with our changing demographics in this country, to really get accurate numbers because that tells you where we need to deploy resources. We're very fortunate here in Baltimore. We have a lot of sickle cell expertise, but if you go to other parts of the country, there may not be as much expertise and there may not even be a hematologist within 30 miles of where some of the patients are. So many of these patients end up getting cared for in emergency rooms or by primary care doctors who really feel very alone with some of the advances that are going on. It's a very important question. My guess would be it's closer to 120,000 to answer your question directly. And just to give you an estimate, Nigeria alone, there are about 90,000 to 100,000 sickle cell births a year. Okay. So that leads into our next line of questioning. You mentioned that this is hereditary. It is a gene that comes a recessive gene, perhaps. I'm not sure. Correct me on this. Yeah. Both of your parents have, and then it will show up in the child if there is that match. Does this occur exclusively in the Black community? Because you're talking about the much higher rates in some African nations. It's not exclusively in the Black population. It is primarily found in the malaria belt. So that includes countries such as parts of India, parts of Greece, Asia as well. Now, the biggest population is in the Black population in sub-Saharan Africa. And the reason for that is in order to have sickle cell disease, as we talked about, you need to have two copies of the gene. You inherit one from your mom, one from your dad. But if you only have one and you have what's called sickle cell trait, 
you don't have sickle cell disease. You can pass it, but you don't have the disease. But what that single copy of the gene does is make it much less likely that you're going to die or have a severe case of malaria. So that's how it was naturally selected in that region. That's why you see such a predominance in people from that region. But it's not exclusive to African population. You can see it in, in others. And even in the Hispanic population, it's much less common. And even Caucasian population, even more or less common, but it can occur. You mentioned the malaria belt. Is there anything that has to do with one's skin tone that may make them more susceptible to this? No. Not at all. No. Let's talk about the particular age for sickle cell. Is there a particular age for this when it's generally diagnosed? It's usually diagnosed shortly after birth, usually within the first year of life. Many patients will become symptomatic between three and six months of age. But there are some people who have, for a variety of reasons, relatively mild disease, and it goes unnoticed in the first couple of years of life. And then sometimes people find out as late as uh, teenage years or, or early 20s that they have their first severe pain crisis. That's less common. And it's the reason why it's very important to do screening for sickle cell disease in higher risk populations, such as, you know, very important for everyone, especially in the Black community to know whether they are carrying a copy of this gene, because about one in 12 or so African Americans carry this gene. Understood. So how is it diagnosed? You mentioned the screening. It can be a blood test. It can be done in utero. You can make the diagnosis. It's not a difficult diagnosis to establish. So you just mentioned in utero. Are there possibilities for there to be treatment before a child is born? It's an area of active research. Right now, no, there is not a way to do that, but there are groups and plenty of researchers that are looking into the possibility of something called an in utero transplant. This has been done in animal models, not really ready for prime time in humans, but an area of active research. You mentioned that pretty early on when a child is born, that's when many parents find out that this child has sickle cell anemia. But you also mentioned that there are cases where people find out in their teens. Are there particular triggers that will bring on a flare up of this disease yes. in their age? There are a number of triggers that many sickle cell patients will describe. One of them is so many of the patients will tell you when they go into a swimming pool where it's cold or the ocean, that will trigger a crisis and they learn quickly to avoid things like that to prevent these crises. Viral infections, sometimes it can be severe emotional stress can trigger it. Change in weather, rapid changes, you know, one of these late fall days where it's 60 degrees and sunny and then all of a sudden it drops down to 32 at night. That can bring it on. We often see with particularly cold uh, spells in the winter, an increase in sickle cell pain crises. I'm curious about this portion about extreme stress. What do you know about that and why it triggers crisis? Well, the connection with stress is hard to put together physiologically, but it's a common uh, scenario that patients will describe. Sometimes if they're having a family dispute or a big fight with a friend or a boyfriend or a girlfriend, will set off a crisis. Again, a lot of viral infections will set them. And sometimes they just come for no reason at all. So you mentioned the extreme pain and someone, if you're not familiar with this, can visualize why there's pain because the blood cells are sickling. Yes. Um, what can you tell us about some of the other symptoms associated with this disease? It can be quite a debilitating disease. And like so many diseases, there's a wide spectrum. There are some patients that have relatively mild sickle cell disease, and they have very few pain crises, and they can continue their activities of daily living and go to school and work. But there are other patients that have severe manifestations of the disease. And this is probably a little more typical, where they have extreme fatigue. They have enormous amounts of pain during these crises. But even in between the crises, they often have pain. The other problem and the major problem you get from this is the end organ damage. Now, what do I mean by that? 
The end organ damage means damage to other organs in the body. So one of the things that sickle cell does is predispose you to clots in not only the venous system, but also in the arterial system. Patients can get deep venous thromboses in their legs or pulmonary emboli, blood clots into the lung, and stroke can occur. And it can occur as early as in childhood. That can lead to, in addition to all the missed school, it can lead to growth problems, intellectual dysfunction from the strokes. Patients can also be predisposed to infections. Sickle cell patients tend to uh, what we call, I'll use a medical term and explain it, autoinfarct, meaning develop blood clots in the spleen so that the spleen, which is an immune system organ, doesn't function. That can set people up for certain types of bacterial infections. Patients with sickle cell disease can develop retinopathy, which is a problem in the eyes that if not managed can lead to blindness. They can develop, we talked about clots around the lungs, and that can lead to something called pulmonary hypertension, high blood pressure in the lungs, which can be very disabling and cause shortness of breath. They can get iron overloaded from transfusions. They can develop kidney problems, bone disease. I mean, almost every organ in the body can be affected by sickle cell disease. Okay. So I don't know if you've already answered this, but I want to ask it again. So are there other diseases that people who have sickle cell are also more likely to get because they have sickle cell? Strokes, blood clots, kidney disease, infections, bone disease can develop something called avascular necrosis, which is loss of blood flow to some of the joints in the body. Sometimes patients with sickle cell disease may need knee replacements or hip replacements or shoulder replacements from this avascular necrosis, which is basically dying of the blood vessels supplying the bone. Given the extreme trauma that the body is going through, especially when there's a crisis, what is the life expectancy for someone with sickle cell disease? There's a wide range, but the median for females is about 48. For males, it's probably a few years uh, less, maybe 45, 44, but certainly about 20 years plus less than the rest of the population. What's the longest surviving person that you're aware of, a patient? We've had patients with sickle cell disease live into their 70s, uh, late 70s. But again, that's an outlier. There are also patients that die in childhood. Fortunately, in this country, with good pediatric care, about 98% of patients with sickle cell disease survive their pediatric lifespan. Uh That's not true in a lot of other countries where many of the patients die before the age of 12. Unbelievable. I'm just writing down so many other questions because just more questions are popping up into my head. How long have you been in this field, Dr. Brodsky? I've been studying hematology since the early 1990s. Sickle cell disease is a big part of of what we do. We have one of the largest sickle cell programs in the country. Uh, Dr. Sophie Lanscron runs our sickle cell program. We follow about 600 adults with uh, sickle cell disease. And we also serve as a source of consult and education for a lot of physicians, PAs, emergency room physicians around the area through a program that Dr. Lanscron has developed. So given your decades of experience, have you noticed a change? in the mortality rate for the better? Certainly the pediatric mortality has gotten better, but the survival has probably ticked up a couple years, Mm -hmm. but not a dramatic difference. Mm -hmm. Now, we can talk about this a little bit later. The good news is, is that there are curative options now. Again, these are not simple, easy things and not necessarily for everyone, but the improvement that has come over the last decade in this field is very encouraging. The other encouraging thing is that up until recently, there was only one drug that was FDA approved for the treatment of sickle cell disease, and that's a drug called hydroxyurea. There are now four drugs approved for sickle cell disease. They're not major jumps forward, but they are movement forward. And there are, I think, over 30 drugs that are in development right now that are being studied in sickle cell disease. Uh So I'm quite hopeful that in the next maybe three, 
three, four, five years that we're going to have not only more curative options, but we're also going to have drug options that can move that needle and get that survival rate up and improve quality of life for patients with sickle cell disease. So what are our curative options right now and how accessible are they? The only proven curative treatment right now is bone marrow transplant. That used to carry significant risk and still does carry risk, but the risk has been mitigated tremendously. The other problem with bone marrow transplant is that it used to be that you had to have a perfectly matched brother or sister, which Uh most patients didn't have. Maybe only 10 to 15% of patients would have been eligible for a bone marrow transplant, say 10, 15 years ago. Now we've gotten much more sophisticated and bone marrow transplants become much safer, such that probably 85, 90% of patients can find a suitable donor, a donor that is, is safe to use for bone marrow transplant. The cure rate with that is upwards of 85, 90%. That's been very exciting. The other things that you hear about that are potentially curative, although they need longer follow-up, are things like gene therapy and gene editing. But be careful of the terms. These are bone marrow transplants. These are autologous bone marrow transplants, not from a brother's. These are when you take your own stem cells from your body and they are modified and given back after getting very high dose chemotherapy, higher dose chemotherapy than we use when we do a bone marrow transplant. I'm not a medical professional, but I have heard about this gene editing. Yes. Um, The pharmaceutical industries are very good at marketing. They make it sound very simple, like gene editing or gene transfer. These are exciting areas and these are showing early success. The problem with them is they have as much, if not more, of the toxicity of bone marrow transplant. And the other problem is they're incredibly expensive at this point. None of these approaches, the gene therapy or the gene editing, have been approved yet by the FDA, but the cost of them are anticipated to be around $3 million. So per per patient. Yes, per person. Whereas a bone marrow transplant, to put it in perspective, we could probably do uh, 20 bone marrow transplants for that, (laughs) or at least 15 bone marrow transplants for the price of that. I want to talk about the access to this. How accessible is the bone marrow transplant? Is this something that's covered by grants or insurance? Right now, bone marrow transplant is covered by insurance, and it took a lot of advocacy to get that approved. Insurers were kind of silent. It didn't say that that was an approved indication, but it didn't say it wasn't. It was very easy for insurers to say, well, we're not going to approve. Now it's covered. In most states, bone marrow transplant is covered. So insurance will pay for that. Sometimes it's hard to go to centers outside of your state, especially if you're on Medicare or Medicaid, which many of our sickle cell patients are. But certainly within Maryland, it's certainly covered and many other states as well. And I will tell you that there is a multinational trial that has been completed and will be reported soon, sponsored by the National Institutes of Health, using these half-matched bone marrow transplants in 30 plus centers across the United States. And there's two cohorts. There's a pediatric arm and adult arm. For the trial to be finished, it's requiring that all patients be two years out from their transplant to prove that they are truly uh, cured of their disease at that time point. You talked about how effective the bone marrow transplant could be, but what are some of the risks? Lots of risks. There's risk of infection. There is risk that the bone marrow graft doesn't take, although, again, improvements have been made there. There's risk of other organ damage. But again, these are done in patients that usually are having very severe disease, and the risk-benefit ratio is in the patient's favor in the majority of these instances. And like I said, although it's not an easy thing to go through, the cure rate, at least in some single-arm studies at our institution and some others, is now approaching about 90% good chance compared to someone with severe sickle cell disease who has been perhaps in the hospital or in the emergency room three to five days of every month or more and no longer able to work or go to school. And in their life, I want to talk to you about blood transfusions. Are blood transfusions used as a treatment for sickle cell anemia? At times. And blood transfusions can be very dangerous in sickle cell patients too, if they're used 
inappropriately. We use blood transfusions and sometimes what we call exchange transfusions, where we take off 70, 80% of the patient's blood volume and replace it with donor blood. We use that in very severe life-threatening situations. We don't use it just to increase their hemoglobin a little bit to make their anemia better so they have more energy to go to a family gathering. Or The reason for that is because when you get a lot of blood transfusions, and sometimes even when you get a few blood transfusions, you can develop what are called antibodies against the blood. You can burn a bridge with too many transfusions. You can develop what we call alloimmunity or antibody against certain blood types. And then it becomes very hard to find blood for those situations that are very dangerous. So if a patient comes in with something called acute chest syndrome, where they have severe chest pain and a pneumonia-like picture in their lungs and they're acutely short of breath, we will use an exchange transfusion. If someone comes in with a stroke, you know, a child comes in with a stroke from sickle cell disease, a 14-year-old, the chance of having another stroke without regular blood transfusions is incredibly high. And it's been shown through clinical trials that regular transfusions at that point can decrease the chance, not eliminate, but decrease the chance of having a second stroke. This is something that's got to be so stressful for families, whether there are for children or adults. Yep. And so not everyone would be able to qualify for a cure. Talk to us about when it's determined that treatment would be better than taking steps to move towards a cure. The most important message to get out is that curative options exist and they exist now. Now, that doesn't mean that every patient with sickle cell disease needs to rush to get a bone marrow transplant or get involved in a gene therapy or genome editing trial. But every patient and every parent associated with this disease should know that these options exist. I mean, that's called hope. It's a real hope. It's not a pipe dream. Now, who should start exploring these options? Certainly when patients are having severe manifestations, such as requiring intensive care unit stays, patients who have had strokes, patients who are spending enormous amounts of time in emergency rooms and are no longer able to work or go to school because they are spending so much time in the hospital or the emergency room or an infusion center from severe pain. These are the ones that should at least find out about bone marrow transplant or clinical trials related to gene therapy or gene editing to see if they're interested because only the patients can really make those decisions. When I see a patient for a bone marrow transplant consult, I tell them, you're here for information gathering. We're not making any decisions today. I want to give you all the information about bone marrow transplant. You go home, you talk to your loved ones about it. I'm not going to contact you. If you contact me and say you're interested in going forward or looking further into this, we go. Otherwise, that's it. But information is power, and it's very important to have that information. I mean, the transformation in these patients' lives is just incredible. I mean, I'm thinking of a woman that comes to mind right now. She worked in our blood bank. She had four or five episodes where she was admitted to the intensive care unit. I mean, weeks, one of them uh, over a month in the hospital on ventilators, breathing support. One time she was on something called ECMO, which is really highly supportive care. We did a half match transplant on her. Oh, it's got to be four or five years ago now. She hasn't been in the hospital ever since. She doesn't get any blood anymore. She's working at another hospital and and now in the HLA lab, which helps determine if someone's a match or not. It's just incredible to see these patients just blossom and to live life without fear of having a pain crisis. I mean, just imagine what it's like where you have this vacation, you've been planning for nine months and you're going either out of the country, maybe you're going across the country or whatever, and you land and all of a sudden you feel a sickle cell crisis going on. And then you're not in America. And you don't know who to call. You don't know. Maybe they have sickle cell support. Maybe they don't. Maybe the emergency room you're going to go to is going to know what to do. Maybe they don't. It's just awful. I mean, to live with that hanging over your head, I can't even imagine. I could tell you this. It's something that I know personally because my very close family member goes through this. I know. You get it. So I want to talk to you about relapse. If people get this bone marrow transplant, what's the possibility? What's the percentage rate of relapsing? It's very low. 
if the transplant goes as planned and the bone marrow takes fully what we call full donor engraftment, and we usually know that within 60 days of the transplant, the risk of relapsing approaches zero. Can never say anything zero, but it's, it's less than a percent. Now, if someone is what we call a mixed chimera, where they have mostly donor, but some of their own bone marrow that survived the transplant, you can have a late graft failure. That's also less likely these days. Most of the engraftment with the modifications that we've made, most patients fully engraft and the relapse rate is negligible. Now, I will tell you, one of the things that I neglected to mention that is important to mention are issues around fertility and sickle cell disease. It's important to know that there is a lower fertility rate in patients with sickle cell disease. And also with these curative options, that also can affect the fertility rate. Gene therapy, genome editing, guarantee of infertility, even if it's done as a child, guarantee. Bone marrow transplant certainly increases the risk of infertility. We're not sure yet whether it's a guarantee. We have had patients who have had bone marrow transplants be able to get pregnant. It's fairly recent that we've done these calf match bone marrow transplants, which use less chemotherapy. They're called reduced intensity transplants. They're right at the borderline of where they could cause infertility, Mm -hmm. but it's hard to determine whether the infertility was present before because they've been so sick and they've been on other drugs like hydroxyurea or whether it's from the transplant, certainly the transplant's contributing, but we have to learn more about that. And it's going to be important to develop newer approaches that can preserve that. You can mitigate that in men. You can sperm bank before, and we often counsel patients on that. And in women, several of our patients have had their eggs harvested before starting the transplant. Again, we need more research into that and how effective that will be. But those are things that, especially for this podcast, women should be aware of. Before I move on to the next topic, I want to hone in on the treatment. Are medications primarily to manage the pain and the symptoms? Yeah, probably the most common and still to this day, the most effective drug to manage sickle cell disease is a drug called hydroxyurea. That doesn't cure the disease, but it decreases the number of pain crises the patient may have. And in some patients, it can be a major quality of life difference. I mean, there are some patients that'll go from having six to eight sickle cell pain crises a year to maybe having zero to one a year. And they have to take this medication on a daily basis. And it's fairly well tolerated. There aren't a ton of side effects from it. We titrate the dose and some people have a really robust response. Some people respond barely at all. And some people have responses that are in between. What do you see as the future for sickle cell anemia? The curative options are here. And I think there are going to be a number of curative options for patients with sickle cell disease. That's going to be a game changer in the United States, many of the European countries. It's not going to solve the sickle cell problem worldwide. The resources are so limited in some of these countries in sub-Saharan Africa, you couldn't even think about doing a bone marrow transplant. Many of these patients can't even get a blood transfusion. The American Society of Hematology is over there in several of the countries doing screening for sickle cell disease because there's no screening programs over there in many of these countries so that patients can be identified. They're doing fixed dosing of hydroxyurea where they're giving a low dose that you don't have to monitor on a regular basis so closely because it's very hard for these patients to get into a medical facility. They're doing simple things like providing penicillin prophylaxis, which prevents a lot of those infections that I talked to you about from the spleen not functioning well. And those things are having a big impact over there. But we are not going to eradicate sickle cell disease with therapies that cost hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars like gene therapy in poor resource countries or even, for that matter, in the United States and Europe. So we need effective drugs, too. Now, you know that when a new drug comes out, and it can be for hair loss or hangnails or whatever, anytime a new drug comes out, it's expensive. But we certainly need the new drugs. And what happens is over time, these drugs come off patent and there's competing drugs and eventually the prices are pushed down. That is really what is going to be needed to really have a global impact. We need a combination of all of these approaches, curative therapies, drug therapies, better transfusion practices, 
just throwing blood and pain medicines at sickle cell patients isn't going to solve this right now. Unfortunately, that's the best we can offer to several of our patients. But I think we're going to see more drug options and more curative options in the years to come. It sounds like for some people across the globe, around the globe, the change is coming, but it is slow. But what many people are hanging on to is the hope. I've seen a huge uptick and acceleration in the last 10 years, for sure. The number of transplants is going up precipitously for sickle cell disease. And again, these newer therapies like gene therapy and genome editing are probably going to get some type of approval in the next year or two for sickle cell disease. So, you know, again, we need longer follow-up with these approaches before we can say they're curative, but they probably are at least in a percentage of these patients. The early data is very encouraging. So we might have three potentially curative approaches. Like I said, we only had one drug. Now we have four and there's 30 some in, in the pipeline. I think we're going to see more and more drugs coming out that are going to have greater and greater efficacy such that we don't need to do bone marrow transplant would be the hope that we would have drug therapy that could be more widely available. And even if it doesn't cure the disease, could keep it in a state where patients can function relatively normally and live close to normal or normal lifespans. Dr. Brodsky, if you had one vital message for women of color regarding sickle cell disease, what would that message be? The one is hope. There really is is hope right now. But you really got to educate yourself on this because you got to get tested. You got to know whether you carry the gene or not, because you can do some planning around that. There's a lot of research going on, and there is a lot of hope for patients uh, with sickle cell disease. And knowing and being connected into centers that can help with this is very important. Dr. Brodsky, is there anything that I did not ask you and pick your brain on that I should have? Well, you asked a lot of great questions. I mean, this is such a big field. We could go into so many different topics on sickle cell around health equity, and there are lots and lots of issues around here. But I think you hit on the main ones, knowing this disease, being knowledgeable about it, knowing that it's a genetic disease, knowing that there are treatments for it, knowing that there are potential cures for it, knowing that there is enormous amount of research that's going on, not only at our universities, but also for the first time in ever, the pharma industry is very interested in sickle cell disease. And that's hopeful. I couldn't say that 10 years ago, but now those 30 plus drugs in the pipeline, they're coming out of pharma. That's encouraging. I briefly hinted at the fact that this is something that is so personal to me because one of my immediate family members, he has sickle cell. And especially during COVID, he had to go hospital. We weren't able to be there with him at the hospital. And it was just extremely scary. And when you're telling me now that blood transfusions, the severity of blood transfusions, they had to have that. I'm so grateful for the resources that we have available. And when you talk about traveling, that hits home because we know that there could be dehydration when they're on the plane. I know the importance of them having the water. It's just all of those things. So I'm so grateful for the access that we have and I'm hopeful for the access that people around the globe will be able to get. Even doing all the right things, and I'm sure he's doing all the right things, as you know, you're still going to have crises. And the other thing that we didn't talk about that I perhaps should have is the mental health issues. You can quite understand how a patient with sickle cell disease can become quite despondent and depressed at times around their disease for all the reasons that you know very well from your family member. It just amazes me. I mean, these patients are so inspiring, the resilience that many of them have and the fight that they have to go through this. The other thing we didn't talk about is the stigmatization that they get in certain emergency rooms. And just a real quick anecdote of a patient of mine also transplanted. 10 plus years ago, doing extremely well. But she used to tell me how when she had a pain crisis coming on, the first thing she would do was get in the shower in spite of a severe pain crisis, do her hair, do her makeup, and get out of her sweats and put her nice clothes on to go to the emergency room because she didn't want to go to the emergency room looking disheveled in sweats and a t-shirt and get accused of drug seeking. That's another whole area of this disease, but again, highlights some of the issues that many sickle cell patients go through. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today, talking to us about sickle cell anemia. This is a woman's journey and we'd like to thank you, Dr. Brodsky. This activity is supported by an unrestricted contribution from Lily. Dr. Brodsky serves as a professor of medicine and director of the Division of Hematology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. And I hope you will join us next week for the final podcast in the special podcast series, A Journey for Women of Color. Next week's podcast, Diabetes and Women of Color, will feature our final Johns Hopkins expert, Dr. Sudipa Sakar. And I cannot wait for you guys to hear about this conversation. It was absolutely enlightening for me, just like this conversation here. Dr. Sakar serves as the director of the Inpatient Diabetes Management Service at Johns Hopkins Baby Medical Center. In the meantime, if you have enjoyed today's discussion, which I have no doubt that you have, please tune in to next week's podcast. Also, check out Women's Journey's website, hopkinsmedicine.org forward slash a woman's journey for information about upcoming free webinars. Subscribe to our Insights That Matter podcast series and sign up for our monthly email as well. Thank you, Dr. Brodsky. Thank you for getting this very important message out for what you're doing.